Starting a new series this morning, the start of the new quarter and uh, start of a new series. And I want to sp- speak to us over the next few weeks and we want to get into a few things in the Word of God. You know, we're talking about uh, our walk with Christ, understanding our, our purpose on this earth because your life has a purpose. You're not saved just to be a, a, a pew warmer. You're not just saved to be in church every Sunday, but you are saved what, to, to live a life of purpose. But we have to understand who's and who we are. We have to understand from what vantage point, from what foundation do we live our Christian lives? And the title of my series this, the, of the next few weeks, that you might have life. I want to talk to us a little bit about understanding your life, the life that Christ came to give us, that you might have life. And John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, the thief comes only in order to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I've come in order that you might have life and life in all its fullness. The thief comes only but to steal, to kill and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life, that you might have it in all its fullness. And so Jesus says that He's come to give us life and not death. Can you say amen this morning? So the gospel is not a message of losing, but it's a message of gaining. The gospel is not a message of dying, but the gospel is a message of living. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, I've come to give you life. So Jesus didn't come that you must die, but that through His death, you and I might have life that we might live. Let me say that again. So Jesus has not come that you and I must die, but that through His death, you and I might have life and that we can live. Because He says, I've come to give you life. Now we know, Ephesians 2 verse 1, the Bible says, And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. So notice what your Bible says. The Bible says, And you and I, we were made alive. So Christ comes to make us alive, that you might have life. Can you say amen this morning? I know we die once when we believe. When we receive Christ into our heart, the Bible says you died once with Christ, but then we are made alive. So you are here this morning, if you're in Christ and you're a born again believer, the Bible says that you are alive in Christ. There is a purpose for your life. You're on this earth for a reason. I know the famous, or not the famous, but these sayings in the Christian church, and I believe that for years as well, less of me, more of Him. I understand all that. Less of me, more of Him before Christ. Less of us uh, in our own Adam nature, our self-righteous nature our own physical flesh, whatever it might be. But the minute you put your faith in Christ, the Bible says you then die with Christ symbolically. You are crucified with Christ. You died, you are buried, you are raised, you are ascended, and now you are seated next to Christ in heavenly places. But you, He made alive in Him. Can you say amen this morning? And you, He made alive. So you're not dead this morning. You died once, but you were dead in in sins and trespasses, but now you've been made alive. Come on, give Him a shout of praise all over this place this morning. So my question to us as we lay a foundation, and we're going to get into a few of these things over the next few weeks, because it's vitally important that we understand that as a born-again child of God, you don't allow the thief to steal and kill and destroy what is rightfully yours. There are certain kingdom benefits that are yours. You have to understand how to walk in them because it affects your purpose out there. It affects your mindset out there. It affects what you believe, what you see, what you pray for. It it affects the goals you set in life because very often we don't think we're worthy of something or we don't think it's God's will for us in some areas of our life because the thief is busy stealing, killing and destroying. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack these truths. We want to understand what is this life that Christ brought for us? What is this life that Christ gave us? Because you, the Bible says, and I, He made alive together with Him. So my question this morning is, are you alive, but you've not yet received the Christ life that's available to you? Don't um, don't mistake being alive and the life that Christ wants to give us. So all of us are alive this morning because we are here and we can hear my voice. You're alive in the natural. You were given life through your natural mother and your natural father. But then the Bible says your heavenly father wants to give you a new life. And that life is in the, it works uh, hand in hand with your physical life. So you have one life when you're born with your mother and father, a, a human heart, a human life. But then Christ comes and He says, I've come that you might have my heavenly life, a spiritual life that works now hand in hand with your earthly life life. And these combinations is what God wants to use to navigate us through our lives, to lead us and guide us in the plan that God has for your life. So we have to shift from a have not life before Christ, because if you, before I was in Christ, I had not the ability to hear and see spiritual things. I didn't have the ability to know things that the spiritual realm can reveal to my heart, because you get a new heart in Christ. So we have to shift our mindset from a have not life before Christ to a have life mindset in Christ. We have to shift from death to life because you and I, He made alive. 
When we believe, we die once and then we are alive. You are alive this morning. But the enemy wants to tell you you're not. The enemy wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said so. Not me, not the pastor, not the church. Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He said, but the thief comes only. To, to, to rob you of all of the benefits that are yours as a child of God. And you have to know what to say to Him, when to say to Him, how to resist Him. When He comes in the midnight hour, when, he, when you're going through circumstantial pressure, when the, the natural of your life is not working out the way you'd like it to work out, when the goals you set in January or aren't manifesting in March or April, and the enemy starts to come and change the perspective of your life through lies, because he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it in its fullness and in its abundance. Can you say amen this morning and give Jesus one more shout of praise all over this place? So before Christ, we are alive, but we did not have life. Before Christ, we are alive, but we did not have life. You are living in the natural, but we do not have the life of Christ. It's, a, it's, a, it's an addition, it's a change, it's, a, it's an identity change. We were dead in our sins and our trespasses. So when we start telling people to stop sinning, it becomes a complicated statement because the Bible says what? We were dead in our sins and Christ came to defeat sin and death, the law of sin and death. Christ came to overcome sin. So when we have the life of Christ, we start to renew our minds. And the Bible says we start to change our actions. Our actions changed from when we were only in the world and we saw things only in the natural. Now the Spirit of God lives in our hearts and He can teach us to walk away from things that we did before we had the life of Christ. So before we were in Christ, we did not have peace with God. Anxiety and worry were our guides in life. Why do you worry, says Jesus, about your tomorrow? Why do you worry? Why do you, why do you walk? in anxiety but pastor I've got pressure I've got challenges do you do you never are you never anxious as a born-again Christian of course you are the, do, you, do you never worry as a born-again Christian of course you do worry as a born-again Christian but the Bible says that's not who you are and the Bible says the thief will want to take you back to when you were before Christ and try to make you live in that realm only and you have to understand who's and who you are this morning. You see, before Christ, we didn't have the ability to bear the fruit of the Spirit, but we were trapped in the realm of the flesh only. So the Bible says it's the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. So before we're in Christ, before you have a new identity, before you have this life that Christ came to give us, this life that He put inside of us, this life that He takes your old Adam life and He puts a new life in you. And the Bible says you now have the ability because He's the vine and we are the branches. And as we abide in Him, as we are attached to that vine, we become part of a good tree. And that tree, the Bible says, can only bear good fruit. Because it's not your and my fruit, it's His fruit that we carry on His behalf. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. Have you been good all your Christian life? I doubt that. Have you been kind all your Christian life? I doubt that. Have you been patient all your Christian life? I doubt that. Why? Because He's beginning, He began a good work in you. And He wants you to understand the work that He's busy with inside of you. He wants the fruit of the Spirit to bear through you. He wants you to start to gain victory over areas where you keep stum stumbling and struggling. And that's what the Christian walk is. It's not an avoidance of sin. The Gospel is not a behavior change message. It's an identity change message. Because your identity changes in Christ. And you now get the life of Christ, a spiritual life. Not a flaky life like many people want to portray. The, they make spirituality the scary, spooky thing. No, it's a very real thing. It just takes that heart of stone and it now guides it spiritually. You can see things you couldn't see before. You can hear things you couldn't hear before because you get a new heart in Christ and you get a new spirit in Christ. Your human spirit now attaches to the Holy Spirit and now God leads us and guides us by His Spirit. Are oh, you yeah, this morning? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, again, like I say, I've been born again 30 odd years, 32 years, I think it is this year. And in my 32 years, have I lived a perfect Christian life? No. But the Bible said I've been made perfect because of my new identity. Have I lived a, a holy life? No. Why? But I've been made holy because I'm in Christ. And then if I'm in Christ, I take on the attributes of my new identity that He has. He is perfect. He is holy. He is everything. Amen. He is righteous. And because of Him, I now become righteous. 
got nothing to do with me. So the minute I try to, to, uh, to, to, to live this perfect life and I've tried to avoid sin and I try to, Pastor, shouldn't we avoid sin? Well, try it. Bible says if you want to play the natural game and stay in the realm of the natural where we come from, when we try to do good, the Bible says there's no one good but God. But the minute you're in Christ, the Bible says what now? You are now seen as good because Christ is good. Are you here this morning? So the Bible says this, that Jesus gives everyone who is alive a new life. I've come that you might have life. Not, not uh, that you are alive. We are alive, but He gives you a life. You get a new spiritual life. Listen, as we lay a foundation this morning. John chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says, In Him was life and the power to bestow life. So He has the ability to give us this life because He gave His life for us on Calvary. So the Bible says in Him, what? Is life, what's life? And the life was the light of man. Humans will look for light in every facet, not natural light like we know load shedding in our country. That's natural frustrating light where that light goes out. But the Bible says in Him was life and this life was the light, spiritual light, to see things, to hear things, to be led. The world calls it a gut feeling. Ja, ja, ek het so gut feeling, ek, ek weet nie of ek dit moet doen nie, of ek dit nie moet doen nie, ek sê seker nie, but the Bible says you can walk and be led by the Spirit. So if we don't understand this life and the new identity we have and where we are seated and what God has done for us through Christ Jesus' sacrifice, we're going to try in our own human effort to be good or we're going to try and restrain the flesh or we're going to try that when we tr- when we fall short of restraining the flesh we then find we're indulging in the flesh and guess what we're still in the flesh but the bible says we walk according to the spirit we are led by the spirit can you say amen this morning so in him was life in you this morning is life if you're a christ if you're a christian in this place this morning you're born again say with me this morning i have life in me to say with me this morning, I have light in me. So if you try to interpret John chapter 1, in Him was life, or John chapter 10, I've come that you might have life. In the natural, most people associate this life with stuff. I, I want to live a good life, your best life. Not, not anti that. But, uh, but the natural life is temporary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a short season of your, your eternal life. And if you think that the life that Christ came to give you is just natural, you're going you're gonna to equate it to stuff. A house, a car, a boat, a holiday house, money in the bank, uh, all the natural things. And that's not the life that He came to give us. The manifestations of walking in His light and the path that He has for us will bless your life and there'll be natural manifestations. But that's not the life He comes to give us. You are not measured by the stuff that you build up on this earth because Jesus said so. He said, what does it help you gain the whole world? But you lose your eternal salvation because you're focusing on the wrong stuff. That's what he's talking so I say this to us because the natural life is a life that wants you to be blessed, but that's not the life He came to give you. He came to give you life and light, to see things in the spiritual realm. For I know the plans I think towards you, says the Lord. They are not plans of evil, but plans of good. And the Spirit of God now comes to do what? To guide you in that plan spiritually. So you can be led by God's Spirit 24-7, 365. It's not a disposition. It's not, a, it's not a look. It's not a feeling. You can't serve Christ in your feelings. Can you say amen? Because if you try to serve Christ in your feelings, you're going to be a very yo-yo Christian. I feel like worshipping today. I don't feel like worshipping. I feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like reading my Bible. You can't serve Christ in your feelings. Your new identity is what it is. And God wants to lead you and guide you and show you this identity throughout your walk with Him. Amen. So the life, the word life, it means much more than just being alive and breathing oxygen. We think it's life. Now, if your body's got sickness, can we pray for healing? Of course we can. It's biblical. By His stripes we are healed, we can pray for sickness. But guess what happens? If we could pray and keep ourselves alive all our life, we'd have a human problem. We'd have too many humans on the earth because we'd we'd never die. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Even if you die in this temporary season, you will live forever. So we never die. As a Christian, you never die. We just leave the season of the flesh box and we go into the eternal part of our life. But when you're in Christ, you get eternal life. You're not temporarily saved. You are eternally saved. You don't get temporary life. You get eternal life. You you get everlasting life, not temporary life. It doesn't run out like like, like, like koopkracht. Je het kracht, maar jy het nie gekoop nie. Hy het betaal met sy bloed. Maak het veel sin volgen. 
So this life that we get, it's the ability to see life in both realms. The difference between the world and us is the fact that the world wants light. They look for light. They try to find light. Spiritualism, philosophies, stoicism, ideologies. An idea that becomes a theology is an ideology. So some guy has some epiphany. He has a pizza. It's, a, it's not the one he normally eats. And he gets a different revelation at three in the morning. And he says, I feel. And then he comes up with some thing he writes a bit of a book and then he tells you let's go to the beach and we sit on the beach and then we get quiet and you empty your mind which is impossible because your mind is thinking thoughts all the time then you put across your legs you put your fingers in the air on your kneecaps and you wait for the seventh wave and you look for light and then what do we do because we haven't got the light of life in us we then put a candle on that adds to the ambiance and then oh wait 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 incense Phew. now come here rookie now it's the rookie the finger key in the the beachy key in the golfy and we stalic and now we and it's the position I make light-hearted fun of it because there's a place for separation and there's a place for al- being alone with God and there's a place for that but you're not looking for God because he made you alive with him he's in you he's with you he's permanently with him so you're not, you're not trying to, to find God. Uh, before, before you're in Christ, before you're in Christ, you're trying to find light. You're trying to find peace. You're trying to find reason for being alive. That's why worldly people always want to commit suicide because the thief is lying all the time to them as well. He has them trapped. He has them controlled. That's why the gospel is such a controversial message. That's why they'll persecute us and lie about the church and twist our messages and try and take what we say and say, he meant this, he meant that. Why? Because the enemy knows if a person that doesn't have light and life hears the gospel and the, their heart becomes alive to God, they're going to change. And they're going to become an agent of change. And if they start to understand their kingdom benefits, hey, now this brother or sister becomes a dangerous person. Why? Because now I walk, what? In boldness. I walk in a knowing. You're not going to lie to me anymore, enemy. You're not going to tell me who I'm not. I'm not going to have these thoughts of, of, of worthlessness. I'm not going to have these thoughts of suicide. I'm not going to have these thoughts that I can't do anything. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm in Christ. I have the life of Christ in me. Can you say amen this morning? Come on, give me a shout of praise all over this place. Hallelujah. You are alive this morning. So this life, it means Zoe. We're laying a foundation over the next few weeks. Don't miss it. Come to church. We're going to open and unpack this. It's critically important. I know sometimes we want the razzmatazz, we want this or that, but I want to take you on a, on a journey over the next few weeks. You understand this life. What does this life mean? That when you wake up in the middle of the night or you go to work in the morning or something goes wrong in the natural, your, your, your circumstance is not your destiny. Let me say that again. Your circumstance is not your destiny. Your circumstance does not determine God's plan for your life. It, God hasn't changed His plan because your circumstances have changed. Have you noticed the weather this morning? Last night, the roof of our houses were, were holding on for dear life because the wind is blowing. And I see now on Wednesday, it's sunny, 31 degrees, no wind. Circumstances change. So we can't change our theology to suit our circumstances. You can't now start saying, I think God is saying this. No, God said something about you 2,000 years ago before you even knew Him. And he said, what? I've come to give you life. And if you have this life, and this life is in you, light is going to follow the life. And the light is the life of man. You're going to live life totally different than what you lived before. Because you're going to see things, you're going to dream about things, you're going to hear things you've never heard before. You don't realize every day as you live your life, the Holy Spirit is knocking on that heart of yours all the time because you have a new heart. Your heart of stone has become a heart of flesh. It is now a heart, it's a new heart. And the Spirit of God, the big S, is now living inside of you. Why? Because you have a human spirit. You are body, soul, and spirit. You body this thing. Look at my body. It's built for comfort, not for speed. That's why I don't do uh, sprints on the, on the uh, ladies track. I run marathons slowly because your body's different. Our shapes are different. Some of us, we used to have borscaster, now it's handcaster. Alles is a sack over the year. I understand it. Then we have this thing of the natural. Let's, let's try and... Let's try and uh, slow the natural process down. And Paul the Apostle says, although the outer man be perishing, the inner man has been made stronger and stronger. Why? Because the inner man lives forever. 
the outer man perishes. And some of you, you know, you, you're contemplating already. I looked in the mirror the other day and I see things are sagging. So I'm going to go and pull my face back and pull my cheeks back and pull my lips back. And all it does is it gives you a permanent smile because now you do this all the time. But guess what? You can be 96 and still be like this. But we know the inner man died in Kankas the infant died. I watch these celebrities and they don't look at us and they go like, Pastor, what do you think about plastic surgery? Nothing. Because God is not on your skin. God is in your heart. God's not on your tattoo. Pastor, what's your, what's your thing about it? Nothing. What's your, what's your, what's your issue? Nothing. Right? Because God is not on your skin. God is in your heart. He gives, he gives you life on the inside. Now, what will happen on the outside is if you want to, you know, change everything in the natural and try and delay things, I'm not anti that because then I, I'm going to become religious. You can't go to the dentist. And you can't do all those natural things. I'm not being religious today. I'm just saying. The life that Christ gives you is not so you can try and delay your natural life until you're 460. You're going to end this life sometime, but your inner man lives forever. Can you say amen? Now, please look after yourself, drink water, go to gym, do all the things you can in the season of your life. But don't, don't assess your life as that person you look in the mirror as the only part of you. It's not the only part of you. There's a, there's a new life inside of you. And the spiritual side of you is the one God speaks to. Because you are a body, you are a soul, you have a mind, you have a will, you have a brain. You have a memory, you have an intellect, you have, you have natural reasoning. That's how you got your degree. That's how you got through school. That's how you get through life. When you read a book, it makes sense in your mind. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ so we can also understand how Christ would have thought in something, but you have a, a natural mind. That's what your imagination is, your dreams. Your, you can imagine a nation. People do great, great things in the world. They haven't got the Spirit of God in them, but they've got an imagination. Every human's got a mind. Every human's got a creative mind. Some minds run to evil. Some minds try to run to good. Some minds try to run to, to creativity. Some minds implode. Whatever it might be, that the, that's the second part of you, your body and your soul. But then you have a spirit. And the only thing that can activate your human spirit is the Holy Spirit. So when you don't have the Holy Spirit, which comes with the life of Christ, when you have this life, I've come that you might have life, you get the Holy Spirit with you. Now when you receive the Spirit of God, your spirit suddenly is activated and there's a third part of you that is activated and guess what? I can see things I never saw before. That's why when the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, notice the occult. They always try to uh, possess uh, something. Uh, when Jesus came to the man of the Gadarenes and he says, why are you coming to torment me? And the Bible says all those demons ran out of that man and they jumped into what? Into the pigs. They look for a vessel. They look for some body to, to obtain. So we're not afraid of the, of the demonic, but the demonic is what? It's a possession for you to try and deceive you into thinking that's the light. And it's a false light. It's not a permanent light. It's, 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 it's darkness actually, but it tries to come across as light. And he says, this is going to give you appeasement. Notice in the occult as well, when they want you to, to join something, they say you must sacrifice blood. They do everything similar to what the gospel is, but it's darkness. And then it possesses you and you wonder why you are uh, thinking bad thoughts or evil thoughts. Pastor, can a Christian have a, a demon? I don't believe they can because when they came to Jesus and said, you are of Beelzebub, you are of Satan. He said, how can, I, how can you be of Satan and of God at the same time? He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So when you receive Christ, guess what happens? Christ now consumes your temple. We have this treasure in earthen vessels and now He starts a good work. So can you be tormented in your mind? Of course you can. Your mind. Can you be tormented in your mind? Of course you can. Can you be depressed as a born again Christian? Of course you can. Can you be suicidal as a born again Christian? Of course you can. Because the thief will come and steal, kill and destroy in your mind. But that's not who you are. You have this life. And the spiritual life that's in you is yearning. Creation groans for the manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. It's yearning to have what? Commune with God. It wants to talk to God. God is spirit. And the true worshipers worship in spirit. Not flakiness, but in spirit. Meaning what? We walk, Adam, where are you? A natural Adam. Now the last Adam comes, Christ, and He what? Gives us life and now He lives inside of us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Are you here this morning? So Moses, show me your glory. It's not the time for the manifestation of the Messiah of the earth. It's not the time. And so we couldn't, at that stage, man couldn't handle the glory of God. And God said, I'll just show you my back. And uh, Moses got a glimpse of the glory of God. The Bible said it almost blinded him. That's the glory of God. It wasn't yet the manifest of time. There wasn't a vessel. There wasn't a, a, a sacrificial lamb that it could consume at the time or it could fill at the time to become that lamb offering for us until the manifestation of Christ. 
But the Bible says when Moses came down the mountain, he says it was a, a glorious moment to experience a glimpse of God's glory. But the Bible said it was a fading glory. He tried to, he tried to keep it like water running out of a, out of a bowl. He tried, to, he tried to keep it and the, the glory kept fading because it wasn't time for the glory to be manifested. And John says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word, what verse 14, became flesh. Christ. And He dwelt among us and we beheld His glory as of the Father. And the Bible says that the glory did not blind them. The woman with the issue of blood, she ran and she touched the glory and she was healed. You see, it's the life of God. And that same life is now inside of you and I. It's not something we look for in the natural, uh, a natural manifestation only, miraculous or miracles. We can't live on miracles. Yes, God is the God of the miraculous, but you have Christ in you 24-7, 365. Are you getting something this morning? So this life, Zoe, the Zoe kind of life, super abundant in quantity, super abundant in quality, the state of what it means, the state of one who is possessed of vitality, not possessed of anything else, but of vitality. It drives out every form of what? The old Adam nature and it puts a new Adam in, the last Adam in you. And now you have what? The spiritual life of Christ. And now He starts a work in you. And as you look for Him, not look for signs. Show us a sign, Jesus. I won't show you any sign. We don't, we don't live our, our Christian walk by signs and wonders. Yes. Do they manifest? Yes. Can, uh, can we ask God for signs and wonders? Yes. But we don't live by signs and wonders. We live by knowings. Why? Because we have the life of Christ in us. And we are now led by the Spirit of God. It's not a spooky, flaky thing. It's a natural thing. It's going to guide you and lead you into all truth. So he says what? The, the, the word Zoe means of the absolute fullness of life. It means both essential and ethical. It means which belongs to God. It means real life and genuine. A life active and vigorous, devoted to God. It means a blessed life in the portion even of this world of those who put their trust in Christ. So the word Zoe, I've come that you might have life, the Zoe kind of life. It means more than just living in the natural. It means I'm going to put inside of you everything, all the plans, all the dreams. I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you before you were on this planet. I knew that you were going to be alive today. And before you even knew who you were through your natural mother and father, I've told you before, I come through the loins of Bernard and June Jeffrey. And I, they gave me the name Aiden. And I got an identity number from the South African government. And now I am a South African citizen. That's my natural life. But the Bible says you must be born again. Why? Because until you are born of the Spirit, you can't have this life. So when I got born again, I didn't lose my mother and father in the natural. I didn't disown them. I didn't lose my natural identity in South Africa. If you ask the government my ID number, they're going to find me with my ID number. You don't lose that, but you gain this new life. And they take your name when you believe in Christ Jesus, the Lord and Savior, the sacrificial lamb. If you'll have faith in your heart and believe, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth what Christ came to do for us, it is finished. Good Friday. He's not here. He's risen resurrection Sunday. He ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father. When you put your faith in what Christ did for us, the Bible says you, you get adopted in as a son and a daughter of God and you get this life. It's a gift. It's free. And now what happens is my name gets written into the Lamb's Book of Life. And if I could call it that, I don't know, but I, you, I might get an identity number in heaven. My ID number, my natural ID number is uh, 690323. I'm a 60s baby. Can you believe it? 690323. I won't tell you the rest, otherwise you're going to steal my identity and, and I have identity theft. And that's what the enemy does. The enemy operates in identity theft. He comes and he steals your Christ identity. And he says, Jy is nie goed genoeg. Jy doe nie genoeg vir die Heere nie. Jy moet meer bid en jy moet meer vast en jy moet meer, jy moet, jy moet, jy moet. And he makes you do this. He makes you go on the self-righteous hamster wheel of impossibility. I must pray more. I must do more. I'm not doing enough for God. I must do more. I must do more. And then we go into 40 days of fasting and you come out of 40 days of fasting. You're thinner than what you were before you went in, but you're still in the same place because you don't understand the life you've been given. I don't criticize it. If God tells you to do it, do it. We don't have to go on social media and tell us you're doing it. We don't want to know about your impressive attributes of the natural because that's not what makes you right with God. What makes you right with God is you get a new heart when you believe and you get adopted in as a son and a daughter of God. You see, the closest Abraham, listen, listen, the closest Abraham ever got to God was a friend of God. I want to be a friend of God. There was a famous song a few years ago, I'm a friend of God. Sure. God's friendly to us, but I'm friendly to my kids, but I'm not my, I'm not my children's friend. 
I'm my children's father. I can be friendly to them. But uh, and, uh, please I ask you, I know parents, you might mean well when you say, my son is my best friend. Please, your son can't be your best friend because your son is your son. You can be friendly to your son or your daughter. Mothers, my daughter's my best friend. Then find other friends because you gave birth to your daughter. If you need friends, come to me, I'll be your friend. But it's because we have this thing about, we, no, I'm friendly to my, but you can never change who you are in relation. You are their parents. You, I, it's my mother, it's my son and my daughter. And the Bible says the closest Abraham got to knowing God was he became a friend of God. Why? Because the Bible said when he believed through faith, which is what saves us, you are saved by grace through faith. Faith is what you have to activate to be saved. But the Bible said because Christ was not yet manifested, the Bible said his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. So that means if you, have, if you have an accounting system, debits and credits, and you say, this person is going to loan money from the company and I'm going to account it to him. The Bible says Abram's faith was an accounting system. God account, He said, while you are in faith, you can be my friend. But if your faith stops, guess what? You're back in the dog box and you have to have faith again. And the Bible says that's why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why? Because they had, to keep, they had to keep using their faith to find God and to keep God. That's why David kept saying, take not your Holy Spirit from me because the Holy Spirit came and went according to your good deeds, according to how you kept the law. And if you broke the law, there went everything again. You were back in the dog box and you had to try again in your natural man. And then when you did something well on the Day of Atonement, when they sacrificed that lamb and they said they blew, blew the shofar and they said in Israel, it's shofar, show good. And so they went on for another few days. And then when they went on, they, everyone was happy. Then the brother made a mistake. And then David cried out and said, Father, created me a clean heart because your heart became dirty and clean according to the covenants. Silly Falcon. I have good Christians that in Christ, they did nothing to be saved. They did nothing to be made right with God. Christ did it all for them. And yet they think they can lose their salvation. They think their heart can become dirty. No, your actions might not be clean, but your heart is permanently clean. Why? Because Christ is in your heart. I told you, we're going to start a series over the next few weeks. And I'm going to massage us into your spirit. Why? Because you have to understand that. You don't pray prayers like David prayed, creating me a clean heart. You got a clean heart the day you were saved. You see, your heart is, is it's, it's, it's clean because Christ is in your heart. Let me show you. I'm not making this stuff up. It's in your Bible. So Jesus gave his life for us in closing this morning. Jesus gave his life for us on Good Friday. And he gave his life to us on Resurrection Sunday that he might live his life through us every day. Let me say that again. Jesus gave his life for us on Good Friday. He gave His life to us on Resurrection Sunday that He might live His life through us every day. So He's in you. He's finished now with what? Giving His life for you. He died once. He's not gonna die again. He's not gonna die every time you make a mistake. He died once. You died once. You don't have to die every day. You died once with Christ. You believed once. Now you have a clean heart. You are right with God permanently. Why? Because He lives inside of you. You have life in you. You have the life of Christ in you. Come on, give Him a shout of praise all over this place this morning. Woo. Come on, be seated for a few moments. You've got nowhere else to go because it's going to rain and the wind's blowing and you're going to have an unpleasant time at home. You might as well stay here. We'll finish at 12. Is it fine? Woo, Pastor Kerk is finish. No, no, we're going to long care go now. So this life brings kingdom benefits. You have rights. For example, if, you, if, if, if my children, I told you, my children are, are uh, born through our loins and they've got names that we named them and um, they've got ID numbers, etc., etc. but they are my children and they're hoping that I'm going to leave them an inheritance one day. There's promises made by parents because a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. Now, in the natural, they can only benefit from my from my, um, in, or the inheritance, or from my testament, or from my will, if I die. While I'm alive, my will is not active yet. It's a promise. So the Bible says there were many promises made to the church, many promises made to the early church, many promises made to believers in Christ, but they got activated the day Christ said it is finished, and now it's active. So, so the, the will of God is active. Your inheritance in Christ is active. You have the right to use it now. Not in heaven one day, now. Why? Because Christ died. And when Christ died, it activated the promises. They are now yours. You can walk in your inheritance. 
You can use your father's possessions. My children use my possessions. Why? You can use your dad's possessions. How many of you have never been overseas before? Put your hands up, please. Never been overseas? Make that a prayer request this year. Father, I thank you. Show me the other parts of your, of your house. Because God owns the, the earth. The earth is mine, says the Lord, and everything therein. Not saying chase it and prosperity and money, honey, and all these kind of claim it, name it and claim it. I'm talking about you have the right because it's a promise made by, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. As a businessman, are you praying, give me a suburb? Are you praying, give me a city? Are you praying, give me a country? Or are you praying, give me the nations? Are you asking God for international wisdom? Are you asking God for international uh, doors to open up? You have the right, why? Because it's your, part of your inheritance. You can ask God what? For the nations and He will give them to you. So the Bible says what? There are certain benefits. This is what the Bible says. In Ephesians 3, the Bible says that this life gives you power. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So there's a power that works in us. The Bible says in Colossians that this life gives you Christ's permanent presence. Listen. Colossians 1.27 To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ is in you. He's not on you, He's in you. Christ is in you. He's permanent. You have the permanent presence of Christ with you all the time. It's a mystery, Paul says. It's a treasure we carry in this earthen vessel. It's a, it's a gift God gave us and it's yours to use. Bible says, verse 28, Him we preach. We don't preach anything else. We don't preach philosophy. We don't preach anything else. We preach what? Him. Warning every man, hey, if you don't have Christ one day, you're going to go to an eternity without Christ. We have to warn people, not persecute people, but warn people. You be, be reconciled to God. Give your life to God. Why? Because He gave His life for you. And when you're united with Christ, the Bible says you get life. And what? Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. We are called to be teachers of the mysteries of God. Everyone in this building this morning and online, you are a teacher of the Word of God. The fivefold ministry as pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, that's the fivefold to, that is sent in the body to lead the church. But every believer should be a teacher of somebody else, of this life. Have you taught anybody in the last year about their life in Christ? And when is the last time you sat down and taught somebody from the Scriptures about the life they have in Christ? Very few Christians do that. Why? Because they don't understand. Because the thief is so busy stealing, killing and destroying. They feel so condemned. They feel so guilty all the time. They're not worthy because the enemy says, you can't teach that person. Look what you are still busy with. And what you have to tell the enemy is to shut up because that is not your identity. You were not made right with God through your good works. You were made right through Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. Can you say amen this morning? Listen, the Bible says that we may present every man perfect in Christ. So our role is not to persecute people, but to present people. What? Perfect in Christ. And we have to teach them what their new identity is. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible says this life gives you a new identity. That if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, the Bible says this life secures the promises of God. For all the promises of God in Him, anyone who is in Christ has life and has a new life. Ah oh, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. That's why sometimes your prayers aren't answered because that prayer is not going to be good for you at this, uh, at this time. Or it might not be God's perfect will for you. So God won't manifest that prayer sometimes, but He will guide you into truth that will benefit your life. God will never leave you where you are. He'll always guide you into all truth. Can you say amen? For all the promises of God in Him. Hebrews 8 says what? We have a better covenant made, built on better promises. And the promises of God is no longer our promise to God, but God's promise to us. I promise you I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I promise you I won't leave His orphans. I promise you I'll send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. I promise you I'll guide you. I promise you eternal life. Because I've come to give you life. I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Pastor, can I lose my salvation? No. Why? Because it was never yours in the first place. It was Christ who gave His life on Calvary. One man, Adam, Romans 5, 19. Through one man's disobedience, all became unrighteous. Through one man's obedience, all became righteous. You and I had nothing to do with that equation in the middle. And to as many as received Him, He gave them the right to become the sons and the daughters of God. Are you religious like I was? I was religious, but I wasn't a son and a daughter of God because I never received Him into my heart by faith. I was part of a system that my parents introduced me to. They meant well, because they themselves were exposed to the same system. 
So the systems don't save us. The shed blood of Christ saves us. The resurrection of Christ saves us on Resurrection Sunday. That's what saves us. And we put our faith in that. And then the Bible says He fills you with His Spirit and He begins a good work in you. God is busy with a good work in you. Pastor, as you know, what I can do, I can still have my internet. So I can go internet and go and spring it good on my feed. And then I can see good what I need to look at. And Pastor, I feel so condemned. I know. Because the thief will tell you you should take the condemnation upon yourself. But the Spirit of God is in your heart saying, Aiden, come on, you know better. Hey, Aiden, uh, uh, you're a royal priesthood. Come on, royalty doesn't act like this. Come on, Aiden, you're a holy nation. Come on. And he reminds you of what he did for you on Calvary. He doesn't condemn us. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. If you're feeling condemned in your Christian walk, it's because the thief is busy stealing. And he's busy killing you. And he's busy destroying what? The life that's available to you. And now we start to walk in this. Now, now I've got to try harder. Now I'm going to try harder to prepare. Family, I'm going on a 40-day fast. Send me your prayer request at 3 in the morning. On slap, it's very good to do Do what you must do. Because if God told you to just do it. Jesus' mother said to the, the people, if it, what He tells you to do, do it. And then He turned water into wine. Do it. So if the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, then do it. You have to tell the world about it. It's between you and God. I mean, if you and your wife have a conversation, why don't you post that on social media every day? Why don't you put your, your conversation with your wife on social media? Because you, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intimate conversation. It's a private conversation. So why do we always want to put our conversation with God on social media? Because we don't fully understand what He's busy with. It's still this external validation I need to look holy. You don't have to look holy. You are made holy. You have to look righteous. You are made righteous. Why? Because your identity is righteous. Oh, yeah, this morning. So the Bible says this, this in closing, my final landing, the plane's coming to land, fasten your seat belts, flip up your, your tray tables, put your seat, seat back in the upright position and put away your iPhone and your laptop as we prepare for landing. Ushers, 10 minutes to landing. Please prepare the cabin. Where are you going to your natural life out there? It's full of troubles and worries and doubts and you want to go there to worry over there about you don't know what to do tomorrow because you don't know you have access to wisdom. You don't know that God can guide you to one telephone call that can change the trajectory of everything you've been struggling with in the natural because the enemy is telling you you're going to fold. The enemy is telling you you're going to go bankrupt. The enemy is telling you to take your life because he's trying to get Jesus to take his life. He said, if you're the son of God, jump off this cliff. That's what he does. He's a thief. He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. If, ever, if before you make any decision, destiny changing decision, relationship decision, marital decision, before you make any decision, bounce it off somebody who is spiritual with you. Ask them, can you just, 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 just can you check this for me, please? Can we get a witness here? Because I'm, I don't know if this is truth or not, because I, I want to do this, but I'm not sure. So just rather wait. Don't make any decisions in fear, in haste, in anger, in, in no, no, just wait. There are people around you. Be part of a home cell. Get part of the local church. Why? Not to, not to say what you must or mustn't do, but sometimes a person who's not emotionally attached to your challenge can give you sound advice, wise advice. Just one thing they might say, go, that makes, and the, and the Spirit will confirm that word and it becomes rhema. And I can change my direction of life because the thief will get you to a place of isolation offense, bitterness. Don't let the root of bitterness grow up in your heart. Now, at the door, I saw Pastor Aiden greet somebody else, but I walked past him, he didn't even greet me. Why did not? Am I not, I'm not liked anymore. Why doesn't Pastor Aiden greet me? Come and greet me after the service, I'll shake your hand. What am I saying? We can sometimes get so offended by small things and the enemy will take those small things and make them mountains. Why? Because if he can get you bitter and get you to be in the front of the church, middle of the church, back of the church, twice a month in the church, once a month, I don't believe in church, gone. Why? Because he's a thief. Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Now he isolates you. Now in a place of isolation. There's a time for separation and there's a place of isolation. Isolation is where he's going to trip you up and he's going to lie to you. Because there's no one to check that blind spot in you. That's why he could come to Peter and say, Peter, the enemy wants to sift you like wheat. He could see Peter's going to deny him. He could see Judas. He said, the one who betrays me, sit here. He saw Judas was going to betray him. He knew. He's God. So God's not ignorant of your battles he's not he's not naive that he doesn't that he doesn't know you're going through battles the bible says christ was tempted in every area yet he never sinned that's why he's called the savior will you be tempted yes will you fall short of the glory of course you will why because you're still in this flesh box but that's not your identity and the spirit of god will come and tell you who you are the enemy will lie to you and tell you who you're not and he will bring condemnation and there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in christ so the bible says this 
Verse 21, this life gives you your anointing. You have an anointing. Jy is gesalf vir oogend. Jy is gesalf, broer. Jy is gesalf, sister. Jy is gesalf. You don't need a prophet to anoint you. You don't need to pay 5,000 rand for a prayer to find your wife. You just have to open up your eyes and put makeup on and put the odor on and come to church. You don't need me to come to your business and put oil on your door. Read a book on how to run a business. That'll help. I know a guy who wrote the book. It's called Born to Prosper. It's a good book. I know the author. Read it. Why, Pastor? Because you are a three-part being. Your body, soul, and spirit. You're not just spiritual. Now you've been lazy in your natural, man. You haven't read something. You haven't been dedicated to the natural. Now you want a miracle. Now you want a silver bullet. Now God must pour a, a raven, must fly over your roof, and then drop a bag of money on your roof. And you're going to go, ooh, suck hell to be duck fall. No. Get back to the basics and read a book and go see an accountant and sort your finances out. Go back to your health. The doctor says this. Now the doctor says this. Now we want to go to the gym. Why didn't we go to the gym before the doctor said that? I'm talking to myself. Don't worry. Because I have the same battles you have. I, have, I don't want to go to the gym. I want to spend all the money I have. I said, I also want to eat whispers all day. I also want to lie on the couch and watch rugby and drink coke and, and just vegetate. I also want to do that. I also don't want to come to church and preach on the Sunday, but my wife reminds me I have to because I'm the pastor. I also want to be at Blue Peter this morning, and I, but I have to preach about St. Peter. I also have things I don't want to do, but guess what? I have to do them. So there's things you might not want to do, but you have to do them. But then that doesn't mean to say that God's changed His plan with you. So there's, you're a three-part being, but you have an anointing. So the Bible says this in verse 21, Now He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God. So you have an anointing. Verse 22 says, This life gives us the Spirit who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts. So the Spirit of God is in your heart. And the Bible says in Romans 5 that the Spirit of God is now, the love of God has now been poured out in to our hearts. So you have a clean heart. You have a good heart. You want to do good. Do you know that? You actually want to forgive that person that's harmed you. You know that? You actually, you actually want to walk in unity because your heart is, keeps telling you, say sorry. But your flesh keeps telling you, no. They must first. They must first. And Jesus said, unless a grain of seed falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. Now you're in, a, you're in bitterness. You're a born-again Christian, but it looks like you've been sucking lemons all your life. You come to church and bah, bah, you're, like, you're like a... You know when, when I was younger, I had a boil once. You know that, a boil on your leg? Yeah, and it was, saying, it was in, inside of my leg. Yeah, I was playing sport and I got a boil. And I went to the doctor and I tell you for like a week, you know, you, you walk like this, you, you, your pants touches it. It's like you get in the bath and the hot water. And you, you can't, it's, and that's what sometimes like Christians are that are being lied to by the enemy. You walk near them and it's like, what come I thought the brother was born again. No, it's because you're being lied to because now everything's sensitive because you, you're building up all of this resentment. That's a, it's a bitterness. In, it's a, the bitterness that's inside. It's like a boil. And until you don't release that, place of pressure through what through you becoming that seed through the spirit of god talking to you by you saying sorry first by you saying to your wife liffy yammer for my nonsense forgive me that's how we reconcile unless a grain of seed falls in the ground and dies it remains alone so listen listen so this morning who is in your life this morning who is in your life this morning where you have to forgive somebody. Paul writes in Colossians 1, he says, forgive your brother as Christ has forgiven us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Who is there? I just sense in my spirit this morning. You're sitting here for the last few months and everything just, your, your conversation goes there. Your thoughts go there. Your, your, your actions go there. When you're on Facebook, you go look what they're doing on Facebook all the time because everything's about this person because there's unforgiveness there. And you know you've unfollowed them. When you hear they're coming to this place, you don't come. At work, you walk on the other side of the aisle. At church, you sit on this side of the church. Now you leave the home cell because it's whatever. And all I say is this. I ask you this morning. As easy as what it is for me to say that, and as hard as what it sometimes is to do that, I ask you, you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the Spirit of God in you. And God is saying to you this morning, forgive them. doesn't mean to say you have to be friends with them again or go eat with them, or even be in business with them, but at least will you forgive them? Well, because the Bible said unforgiveness, well, not the Bible, there's a saying that says unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. When I went to the doctor, he said to me, what's going on, do you drink drug, booty? And I was young, and he said, we are going to drink And I went, okay, doctor, and I was waiting for three, and he pushed it on one. 
I went, ah! And a week later, it was all clear as if there was no pain. And that's what forgiveness does. It brings out that hurt, that, un- that, un- that, un- that uncomfortable conversation, that uncomfortable conversation you've been avoiding. That uncomfortable conversation you've been avoiding. Go and have it. Go and face that person or email that person or WhatsApp that person. And if they don't choose to forgive you back, you rest in that because you've done your part. And you allow the Spirit of God to work in them. And I guarantee you, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your forgiveness is genuine, God will work in their hearts if they're a Christian. And God will get them to say, I forgive you too. And we can have reconciliation because we have a ministry of reconciliation. Stand with me all over this place this morning. You receive the word? No dunkilla. Proverbs 4.23, the Bible says this, Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance, and above all, that you guard, for out of it flow the springs of life. The Bible says your heart, that word issues, another translation, New King James says, for out of it flow the issues. That word issues, I studied it once, and it speaks about geographical locations issues what causes issues in our life are the issues of life but the Bible says if you don't guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of geographical locations many people are in geographical locations that they have put themselves in because they wouldn't guard their heart the heart that the Spirit of God is in the thief comes only but to steal to kill and to destroy but I have come that you might have life and life in abundance and I say this to you today Sometimes some of you may, might be sitting here this morning, you're on the verge of making a decision, but it's out of bitterness and it's out of anger. And it's going to affect the geographical location of your life. It's going to move you from where you should be to where you're going to go. Not that you can't get back to where you were because the Bible says the prodigal son, he was in a geographical location through issues. And then the Bible says when he came back, he thought he was a slave. He thought he'd lost everything. And his father said, no, you're not a slave. You're a son. Just come back. So we can come back. God will restore. And we know all things work together for good. But I say this, the Bible warns us to guard our hearts. Why? Because the thief wants to come and lie to you. Because the thief comes only but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life. And this kind of life is the Zoe kind of life. There are places of your life that you are in delay. Delay is not denial, but you're in delay because there's been uh, decisions you've made. And I believe this morning the Lord wants to speak into your heart by His Holy Spirit. And it starts in one place where we start to say, Jere, forgive me for my hard heart and let me forgive my brother, my sister. Maybe you have to have a list. I don't know how long that list is. We're in this world. Could be three, could be five. Could, the person could be dead. Could be a dead father, dead grandfather, whatever. I just sensed in my spirit this morning as I was speaking, coming to the end of the service, I believe the Lord wants to speak into someone's heart here today. I ask you this morning, let that thing go. Let it go. Because when you let it go, the Bible says it becomes a spiritual seed that falls into the soil of God's kingdom. And He takes that seed and He makes it and He works it and it germinates into a beautiful tree. And the same place where there was hurt and pain and destruction, there's going to be healing and health and hope and restoration and reconciliation. You're going to sit in a place where you cried, you're now going to laugh. Because the Bible says, if we just allow ourselves to listen to what Jesus did, Father, forgive them. Save yourself, Jesus. Justify yourself, Jesus. Protect yourself. Go into social media, Jesus. Vent on social media, Jesus. No. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I have come that you might have this life. You have the ability to forgive. You have the ability to overcome. You have the ability to live in this life because it's Christ's life in you. It's not your own life. It's His life that's working in you. You have power, not your power. Don't try to forgive in the power of your flesh. Don't worry about the outcome. Just do what the Spirit of God is telling you to do. I want every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Such a great presence of God all over this place. Come on. I'm going to pray. Yes, I'll do that first. I'm going to pray. I want you to take a moment right there where you stand. That person that you have to forgive this morning, I want you to take a moment. And I want you to just quietly there where you stand. Not a, bit, not a heavy, not a big heavy. But pastor, no, no, listen to what the Spirit of God is doing. And allow those words to come out your mouth. Say that person's name quietly. The person next to you doesn't have to hear. Just say, Father, I forgive so-and-so. 
Just say it. Father, I forgive so-and-so, my dad, my mom, whatever. Say the person's name. I just believe in my, in my sense, in my spirit this morning. You're in this place, not by accident. In this moment, just release that person, please, I ask you. As Paul writes, I implore you, make your peace with God. I implore you, be reconciled to God. Now, I implore you this morning, just forgive that person, will you please? Will you say those words? Father, forgive that person and just release it and don't worry about it further. Just release it. Take a moment, please. We're almost done, but it's important because you've been tormented for too long now. You've been worrying for too long. You've been living in bitterness for too long. It's time you've, you release that. Release that, please. Not for my sake, but for your sake and for the people that, you, that love you and for the people that have to live with you. You, 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 you're a good person. You're a loving person. You're a kind person because God's spirit is in you. You're a gentle person. You're a, you're a good person, but, you, but you, you, you're showing traits of the works of the flesh. Why? Because of this root of bitterness that's grown up in your heart. And it's just because the enemy is lying to you. And you're waiting for that person to come to you first. I ask you, go to them first and say, don't have to go to them. Just right here as we stand. Come. I, I, I've never done this before, but I'm just sensing my spirit right now. Do it, please. Just do it and release that person. So, Father, I thank you this morning for your presence all over this place. Holy Spirit, as you've led us this way this morning, if there's one person in this place that's prayed this prayer, Father, then you've come for that one person. We're not making heavy of this, Lord, but as you've just instructed me to tell the church to forgive, I ask you, Father, thank you for your great example of forgiveness. You said, Jesus, to forgive mankind for they know not what they do because we are born in Adam. And our human natures, Father, so often want to do good, but when we find ourselves, we're doing the opposite. And thank you for your power. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your grace that covers us in every area. I pray for the people that have prayed this prayer this morning, Father, that you'll come and you'll restore back the years the locust has stolen, Father. Not a heavy, just a moment. All we need is a moment. And Father, in this moment, as they release those people, Father, I also, with them, we release those people this morning. And Father, we set them free. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we don't pray that just for those people. We pray it for ourselves as well. Just to release those people, Father. And as we release, we place that seed of forgiveness into the soil of your kingdom. And I ask you, Father, that you'll take it. You'll let that seed of bitterness die. And as that seed of bitterness dies, Father, allow the seed of fruitfulness to grow. And as it grows, Father, I pray for restoration. I pray for reconciliation. I pray for areas of their life this morning that they're going to see such a tremendous increase in growth that's going to astound them. We pray this this morning in Jesus' name. Every head, every eye closed this morning. You're staying in this place. You're saying, Pastor, this message is spoken in my heart. I don't have this life. I get not the life of what you're talking about. I don't have the life of Jesus. I'm alive, but I don't have this life. While you've come to this place, not by accident. I say this to you because I didn't have this life. I had religion, but I never had this life. You're staying in this place this morning. You're saying, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know if I should die in the next 24 hours. I can't say with full assurance where I'd spend eternity. I can't even fall off the earth. I can't say that I'm going to die in the next 24 hours. Because the Bible said, I've come to give you eternal life. Do you have eternal life? And the, the Bible says, the way you receive eternal life is I put my faith and my trust in Christ. I believe. Are you willing to say yes to Him this morning? For all the promises of God in Him are yes. Will you say your yes with His yes and allow Him to start a good work in you? Maybe religious like I was. I went to church. I read my Bible. I was in a system. People meant well, but there was no living relationship there. This is a relationship. It's not a religion, my brother, my sister. So that's you all over this place this morning. You're saying that's me, Pastor. Yes, pray with me in a moment. I want to pray with you in a moment. I really sense in my spirit, you've come here today and the Lord wants to do a, a deep work in your heart. He wants to take that heart of stone that we all had in Adam and He wants to put a heart of flesh in it, that heart of the spirit. He wants to give you a new heart this morning, but it takes you to reach out to Him. Why don't you reach out to Him this morning? He's reaching out to you and saying, it, yeah, I will have a bed for you, Pastor. I will have a new life in Christ. I want this life. I want this new heart. I want this new spirit in me. Or perhaps you're serving God at one time like the prodigal son, like I shared earlier. You were serving God at one time. You've moved away. You've grown cold. And this morning, the Spirit of God is talking in your heart. You're not in a place where you should be. You've moved away from your father's house. And this morning, the Spirit, the Word of God is speaking to you. You're saying, yes, I want to get back to that place. I can back at 12 and here off and 4 and like 30 years. So see, for Lord, I see him. The Bible says when the last son wanted to come home, 
He thought he was a slave. That's what the enemy will do. He'll, he'll tell you your identity is lost. He'll tell you that you're a slave. No, my brother, my sister, you are a child of the living God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. But you have to put your faith and trust back in him this morning. And as he got his stuff up and he went back to his father's house, the Bible says his father ran to him, hugged him and said, welcome home. That's what God does. That's what he wants to do this morning. He wants to run up to you this morning and put his arms around you in the spirit and say, welcome home. Why don't you make that decision and say, yes, today's the day. Forget your husband, forget your wife. I know the, the service changed the direction slightly towards the end, but it's just for you this morning. If you're the only person that makes that decision today, guess what? Heaven is rejoicing. Don't stand here this morning starting to reason it. Think about anything else. Forget your husband, forget your wife, forget your mother, father, brother, sister. Forget your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Forget your friend for a moment. As Pastor that always says, when the pastor asked them and his two friends, they never said yes, and he said yes, and his whole trajectory of his life changed. The trajectory of your life will change this morning. You can get this life. I can't give it to you. I can tell you about it, but you're going to receive it when you believe this morning and say yes. So that's you all over this place. Almost calm. Every head, every eye closed. Believers praying in this place. You say, that's me, Pastor. I want this life this morning. I want this new life. I want to believe. I want to put my faith in Christ. Or I want to come back to Him this morning. Quickly, quietly, unashamedly. Just slip up your hand and say yes. Conclude me your prayer this morning, Pastor. I want you to pray for me this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Come, put up your hands. Umbuskam, thank you. Thank you, the back so I see you. And come, tell up your hands. Yeah, that's echo. Come, umbuskam. I'm not going to embarrass you this morning, but I'm going to ask you to be bold. I know it takes boldness, it takes guts. Tell your hands on finish and say, yeah, I want this life. I will free him with God for God. I want a new start. I want a new beginning. Umbuskam, thank you. On the balcony, I see you. And tell your hands on finish. I've got bright lights in my eyes. Sorry, that's why I keep saying, just pick up your hands above your shoulders so I can acknowledge you. Not to embarrass you, but just to acknowledge you. Tell your hands on finish. Sao kum weer. Open off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come, come, come. Listen, people. I say this before we close the service. This is the most important part of the service. People's eternal destinies are in the balance here. Don't stand here today, my brother, my sister. Please, feeling condemned. They, they tell the enemy to shut his mouth, for sh- shut his accusations for a few moments. I know in this moment, I, and I say this because I was there for, for eight years. I had this wrestle at this time in the service. I used to say, Akman Eerste, near. I hate, I hate. Last them all for a bit. You wanted to put your hand up, but you didn't. You felt you should have. Just slip it up now and say, yes. Just pray with me, Pastor. Could you pray, donkey? Donkey, donkey. Come, tell you on top. Up, 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 donkey. Put your hands down this morning. I want to pray in a moment for everybody to put up their hands. Maybe you didn't put up your hand, but you want to. This is why we exist as a church. This is why we exist in God's kingdom is to see people be reconciled to God, to see people make a decision. This is going to be the greatest day of your life. If you make this decision this morning, this is going to be your greatest day of your life. The day you were born was great, but the day you were born again is even greater because now you receive eternal life. So I want you to do me a favor up in the balcony, in the auditorium. Maybe you brought your friend to church, your love, your encouragement can help that person make a decision. But I want you to do me a favor, please. I want you to take your personal belongings, your handbag, your Bible, your cell phone so it doesn't get lost. I want you to turn to your friend and I want you to leave your seat. And I want you to say, come and join me down here in the altar in the front. And we're going to pray together this morning all over this place. And we're going to lead you in a prayer. Come on. I want you to leave your seat. And I want you to take your friend by the hand. And I want you to come down to the altar this morning. And we're going to pray. Come, come, come. Every person who prayed this this morning, every person who put up their hand. Maybe you didn't put up your hand. I want you to leave your seat. I want you to come, 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 come. Come and receive the life of Christ. You can have this life this morning. Go, go. Leave your seat. Come, 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 come on. Put your hands here this morning and encourage them. Encourage them this morning. Encourage them this morning. Leave your seat. Come. Come, clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Encourage people. Go. You're not your accident. I'm going to wait for you. Come, come, come. Come. You're not walking for me. You're not walking for me. You're walking for yourself. You're walking for your family. You're walking for your future. Come on. Come and receive your life in Christ. Come. I've come that you might have life. Oh, come on. 30 seconds. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. In 30 seconds. But you need to be here. Leave your seat this morning and walk. Leave your seat. Turn to your friend one more time. Say, can I walk with you? Can I walk with you this morning? Come on. Are you still coming? Is somebody coming this morning? Come on, you're walking with them? Come on, encourage them this morning as they come. I know, come on. Yes, 
Come, 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 come. Come. Put your hands on your heart this morning, please, you will, you beautiful people in the front. Put your hands on your heart all over this place. Say this with me this morning. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe you've been raised from the dead. Today, I put my faith, my trust, and belief in you. I receive my sonship, my daughtership in you. I receive all of your promises for me. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me. Show me your plans for my life. Spiritually, grow me, mature me, lead me into all truth. Use my life for your glory, for your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise. I love this place.